Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the uh, First John, uh, the epistle of First John. We're in chapter 2. This will be part 9. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for everything you've done for us, uh, for who we are in Christ, that we can trust you, that, that, uh, that you are sovereign, the sovereign God over our lives. I just pray that all of those that were listening here today, all those who are listening, that you would just take and grant us the grace, the mercy, and the peace that we need, the joy and the, the fellowship and the light, the truth of your word. We ask that you would filter out all of that, which is not true, but seal to our hearts that which is true. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to say something up front here that's a little off subject. It's, it has more to do with prophecy, but I absolutely believe that our primary concern until our Lord comes is doctrine, which few seem to be interested in today. That's a hard saying, but uh, because we're anxious for him to appear. But it will make a difference when our Lord does appear. I've tried to point that out in, in a number of videos. So we aspire to please him, whether we're here in this body or, or we're away from it. How we are when he appears, to me, at least in my thinking, is much more important than, than the question of when that he will appear. In fact, I think that if we actually knew the precise day, that there would, there would probably be no need to walk by faith. In fact, knowing the day would, would probably scare the britches off of most Christians. Of that, I have no doubt. I would rather be busy until he comes. We, I believe that we are to occupy ourselves with him until he comes because that is what we will carry with us when we leave here. And it's, it, I find it interesting that uh, John chap, chapter 7, uh, chapter 7, describes Christ arriving at tabernacles unexpectedly. And I think there could be a good argument made for that. Of course, I'm looking forward to spring, but uh, we read in John 7, 8, uh, Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. And when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then when he also up unto the feast, not openly, as it were, uh, in secret, and, uh, of course, we know tabernacles means God is with us. So there's a good argument that I, I think could be made for that. Uh, May 17, I believe, uh, of next year, uh, the May 17 coming up in the year 2022 is Pentecost. May 21 would, a rapture on May 21 would, in fact, see uh, the Lord's return on the exact day that Israel completes a full, complete 80 years I've pointed that out, in, uh, I believe, in my last rapture update. And then uh, October 11th of next year is the Feast of Tabernacles, day one of Tabernacles. So just want to pass that on. Uh, we have every reason to, to, to have hope. If you're paying the least bit of attention uh, to what's going on in the world around us, uh, you can't help but believe that uh, His coming is near. So we're at verse 15 in chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we're going to spend some time talking about this verse. I know we may not cover more than just this one verse in this video, but I think it's important that we look at this closely. The first thing that I really want to point out here is the importance of word meaning and context. Uh, context, context, context. I've always talked about how important that, that is. I see that the world is mentioned uh, three times, uh, so it's obviously important. What does John mean by the world is the question. And, and so are, are we really being told here to clean up the old man? Am I supposed to say, okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I've been preaching that we're under grace, but now we're to to not love the world, so therefore now we're really cleaning up the old man. Is that what the text is saying? I doubt it. 
uh, love not the golf, the, the golf course on Sunday. Okay, I mean, you know, if that were true, then the things of the world would really cover a lot of things. You could, you could just write in a whole bunch of stuff there. You know, love not the earth, that is the planet. The world here means the planet, hardly. Uh, is it saying not to love what God created? I don't think so. For everything that God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. That's 1 Timothy 4. Love not the world. And that word not is a strong word. It's our word uh, uh, may in the Greek. It's, it's a very strong negative, not. Love not. And so we as Christians automatically... Uh, well, we just drop the comfort of God's grace and then we pick up the heavy yoke of the law here? I don't think so. I think the uh, grammar is important. Uh, I've done videos on John 3.16. I know it's not very popular. I've, I've slaughtered a sacred cow, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but even the English says, for God so loved, L-O-V-E-D, doesn't say, for God so loves. Okay, even the English translations get it right. The loved is what it says, not loves. It's an aorist indicative. It's not a perfect tense. The perfect tense would say that, that God so loved, loves the world and he continues to love it. He, he began loving it at a point in time and he continues to love it. That's the perfect tense. It, it's not a perfect tense. It's an aorist tense. Okay. At one point in time, God so fully and completely loved the world, he couldn't love it any more completely, that he gave his only begotten son. And he won't give him again. Christ came to die once. We read on, the text clearly says that, that, that all those believing in him, okay, that all those believing in him might have eternal life. We also know from John 10, chapter 10, but ye believe not because you're not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Uh, and I've, I've, I've talked a lot about this. The death of Christ removed all men's transgressions. God is no longer today loving that world. And we are here being commanded not to love it either. Okay. It's, it should go without saying, if God commands us not to love something, then, then I don't believe that he would love, be loving that something, okay, and vice versa. If God were today loving the world, then this verse that we're about to look at wouldn't make any sense whatsoever, because we're told not to love the world. And the context of chapter 2, and this is important, extremely important, I've told you about the importance of context. And the context is not the world as we know it, you know, with the bars and the, you know, I don't know what, massage parlors, just you name it, whatever, you know, all the filth that's out there. Even though that it's true, we live in a filthy world, that's not the context. The context is one that is, is ecclesiastical. It's a church context. It's not presenting the world in the, in the sense of, of wickedness, although which certainly includes physical carnality, but it is certainly not limited to that. Uh, we've got to understand what the word world here means, and so we're going to try to spend a little time on this. The Holy Spirit always has an intended audience in, in any verse of, or, or text. Okay, The Holy Spirit's audience here is the church. And the concern is what we've seen uh, in the text as we've studied it uh, from the beginning of 1 John chapter 1. Okay, uh, the, it's a church context. And so uh, the concern's about truth, uh, it's about doctrine, it's about walking in the truth of God's word, walking in the light, which precludes what you might call moral conduct or behavior. We're not under law, but under grace. It is... It is through an, a proper understanding of scriptural truth that our behavior, our conduct follows. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
I believe, and I, again, I, I've always cautioned people against believing anything I believe. I don't want you to believe something just because I believe it. We have to remember the importance of context. I believe the Holy Spirit defines the world in this context as an ordered system, uh, an orderly system. It's a system. I see millions of God's people who, uh, even though they're free in Christ, are needlessly laboring in bondage to a human merit-based religious system that's passing away. The planet, as we know it, you know, uh, spins on the axis of this human merit-based system. It's all we've ever been taught ever since we, uh, well, from the cradle on up. That's how it's operated since the human race fell into sin. And that is true whether we're talking about the mainstream ecclesiastical system or whether we're talking about the non-believing world. We are not being commanded not to love the planet. Okay, we're not being commanded not to love our enemies. Okay, we are, I believe, being commanded not to love that world system that operates in any way which opposes the will and work of God in our lives. Now, we know the righteous man, the new man, doesn't love the world, but the flesh does. Okay, the old man does. Those who are striving through the flesh to become acceptable to God or to maintain some right standing before God by means of the law. Those who have a zeal for God, you know, but not according to knowledge. They do. Those who are seeking to secure victory when God always leads us in triumph, they have to love that world religious system. Okay. Okay. Those lacking a good conscience based on the person and work of Christ. Those whose conscience has been defiled. Those have to love that world system. We do not love that world system. We are commanded here not, and this is a command, not to love that world system. Those who uh, somehow have come to believe that, that our behavior somehow earns ew, God's favor. That's what I'm talking about. That is the system, I believe, that we are commanded here not to love. A system uh, you know, that's a system that, that sends us forth, you know, uh, among men to earn a forgiveness, earn God's love, earn a grace which our God has already bestowed upon us, you know, earn that uh a most needed peace, a most needed joy, you know, that's believed to, to come about through human performance, human effort, human works, when the works of the flesh lie in direct contrast to the beautiful spirit, the, the fruit of the spirit, okay? You know, a, a human merit-based religious system, you know, filled with little children for whom Christ died. Steve, you're bashing the, the church. Well, uh, not exactly. I'm bashing a system. I love God's people that are trapped within it. In fact, it's a very, it's a prime, the primary reason for this ministry. I'm not bashing Christians. I'm not, I'm not bashing God's people. I'm bashing that system that he hated. He hated it so much that he commands us here not to love it. Okay. I don't believe that the love of God abides in that system. They don't, they, you know, for the most part, you, how can you believe that God loves you? And notice it's the love of God. It's not your love for God. It's the love of God. And it doesn't abide in that system. It can't abide in that system because unless we understand that, that unless we understand that the reason why we love him is because he first loved us. Dearly beloved. Listen. If we don't know God truly loves us, if we don't truly know the love of God, then the love of God is not in us, okay? Because we love him because he first loved us. There is the importance, all important, uh, the vital, it's vital that we cross reference, okay? No verse stands alone on its own merit. The, the word world, that's cosmos. There's a lot of references. There's, there's nearly 200 references. In Matthew chapter 30, uh, 13, 
The field is the world. Okay? The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. And, and modern Christianity is offended by the suggestion that there are actually two families. That God just can't, he can't have his own family here. You know, that the, the tear becomes wheat or, or goats become sheep. So God just, he, he just can't be just in having his own family, which really to me is just plain foolishness. Because he does have his own family. There's the importance of realizing that God uses the phrase the world to describe a religious system based on human merit. Do we have other verses to confirm that? Yes, we do. Same author, John, chapter 15. If the world hates you, now, okay, Steve, but you know, those non believers out there, they really hate me. Now, I don't really think they give much thought for you. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't think they spend much time hating you. Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Well, how did, they, how did that system hate him? What was that system that hated our Lord Jesus Christ? He says, if you were of the world, okay? So we're not of the world. So here we're told to command, we're commanded not to love something. Well, why, why, why should there be any surprise? We're not of that system. Okay, if you were of the world, now wait a minute, I'm of the world, I live in the world, I'm just like, everybody. I'm a human being, and I, I live in the world. The, it is not the planet, folks, it is that world system based on human merit. And he says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, oh, oh, uh oh, election here, big danger sign, election, Steve's preaching election, Click off, and you're gone, just like the disciples were when Jesus pointed that out openly and publicly. They no longer walked with him because he said, unless it were given you of my Father, you can't come to, unto me. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the, therefore the world hates you. And it gets even better or worse, depending on how you look at it. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they've persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. And here we are, that's the word guard, uh, keep. Uh, we keep his commandments, just like we were reading in the text here. Okay. Uh, if they have kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake. Okay? Non-believers don't hate you for his name's sake. Because they know not him that sent me. Verse 25, they hated me without a cause. All right? And, the, and what clinches this for me, folks, is John 16:1. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Okay, well now you can argue that the world out there that doesn't know God is the one putting you out of the synagogue or putting you out of the church. I would argue that that's not the case at all. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he, oh my gosh, killeth you who think that he, do, he thinks he, he's doing God a service by killing you. Now, you could, again, you could argue, well, Steve, that's, that's got to be the New World Order. That's got to be some FEMA concentration camp, de uh, uh, detainment camp. Uh, that's got to be some re-education re camp. It's got to be got to be some guillotines in some hangar somewhere off in Iowa someplace. You know, that's, that's not what that's talking about, dearly beloved. Okay. Look at who persecuted and put to death the first century Christians, the early church. It was that religious system based on human merit. Okay, and these things they will do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. When we went through our study in Colossians 2.20, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, 
So we are dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. Why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, and that's all you hear when you go to go to you know, most church meetings today, it's all about, you know, what to handle, what to touch, what to taste, what which are which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Doctrines of men, not scriptural, sound, biblical doctrine, but doctrines of men. We haven't gone through the book of James, but James 4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses. And right away, we think of that in the physical sense. And that may be also true. But know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, if you're a Christian, you're a born-again child of God, saved by the, the loving grace of God, and you're living in that filth that we commonly think of as the world system, well, guess what? You are not God's enemy. Okay? Do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in, in us lusts to envy, but he gives more grace? Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. And if there's anything that that world religious system is marked by, it's human pride. I hate to jump ahead, but we're going to jump ahead here in just a second to 1 John chapter 4, verse 5. They are of the world. They speak they of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This is a religious, Christian, ecclesiastical, church context, folks. It's not talking about all the filth out there that really if we're if we're if we're just simply a christian at all we shouldn't you know it's it's not a we're not we're not looking at uh this is not i don't know how many times i've said it this is not a rule book on how to to live the christian life it is primarily first and foremost it's primarily a revelation of the person and the work of christ there's there's a lot of importance to noting what God doesn't love, okay? Jesus hated legalism, all right? We read about it through the Gospels. You, if, if you've ever picked up your Bible and read through the Gospels, you, you have to, to agree that Jesus hated legalism, or otherwise, I don't know what you were reading. He hated legalism. There's probably no sin more tolerated or more widespread in the Christian world than legalism. It's the very world that our Lord Jesus Christ stepped into. He had more conflicts with the legalists of his day than any other group. It wasn't the saloon gals and the gamblers and the horse thieves and the stagecoach robbers who put Jesus on the cross. It was the legalists. And later on, the Apostle Paul had the same experience as the legalists dogged his steps, perverting the gospel of the grace of God. When we study the life of Christ, we see he did things to provoke these, these individuals. You know, he could have healed people on any other day of the week, but he often did it on the Sabbath. You know, he could have been more discreet in violating uh, the Pharisees' rules, but he did it openly. When a Pharisee invited him to uh, dinner, he, he, he could have gone along with their elaborate hand-washing custom, but he deliberately ignored it. When they questioned him about it, he could have been more polite, but he blasted them for what? He blasted them for their hypocrisy. And when a lawyer pointed out that Jesus had offended them as well, he didn't say, well, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you, good folks. I, he said, woe to you lawyers as well. Jesus confronted legalism as sin. Because why? Because that's what it is. And yet the majority of Christendom today is riddled with legalism. They don't want to talk about that. But it's true. The evangelical church today, as we know it, is plagued by niceness. Somehow we've gotten the idea that to be like Jesus, that means always being nice and never offending anyone. Have I become your enemy by telling you the truth, said Paul. We are to speak the truth in love and leave the results to God. 
No, that's not the, the picture of Scripture. Legalism is an attempt to gain favor with God by your performance. And at its root, its very core root is pride. Because the legalist thinks that he's able to commend himself to God by his own works. Pride motivates him to exalt himself in the sight of others, to exalt himself in the sight of God, in which he, he tends to find fault. It denies human depravity. It exalts human ability. And therefore, it's opposed to the gospel of God's grace. That's why both Jesus and Paul clashed with the legalists. That's the story that we read in the gospels. Jesus hates legalism because it doesn't deal with the condition of our hearts before God, just the outside of the cup, not the inside. And Christianity, folks, is very much a matter of the heart. Everything flows from a heart relationship with God who transforms our hearts by grace. The Jewish religious leaders, they saw themselves as good people because they thought they kept the law when in reality they could not keep the law. No wonder the law was never ever even given to the church. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It isn't Christ plus law. It is dead to the law, dead to the law, as in, as in any standard. What is law? Well, it's, it, that's the Ten Commandments? No. That is any standard, any standard, whereby righteousness is believed to be attained on the human level. Our heart, our affections, our, our will to please God proceeds from a grateful heart for what Christ has done for us. In that life, and only that life is an acceptable sacrifice, a, a clean offering in the sight of God. Pride is at the heart of legalism. Humility is at the heart of true Christianity. Jesus really tore into the Pharisees whose legalism corrupted others. One reason uh, many later reject the faith is that they've been shot through with legalism. And, you know, does the world care about their testimonies, the ones who come out of that legalism? Do they care about that? No, they just tend to think that we're bashing Christianity. Look, I'll, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank you for all of your prayers. I'm feeling much better. But it seems as if, uh, at least it seems like, you know, when some things get kind of straightened out, then other things take their place. I'm having some real eye, eye problems, vision problems. So please continue to pray for me as I do for you. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all of your kind comments, all of your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.